So um, I thought I'll frame the challenge that we have in front of us. I think Ernie yesterday talked about sea level rise and the impact of climate change, and it's a pretty grim picture. What I'll try to do is to talk about what kind of innovations do we need, why do we need to accelerate, and how can we accelerate? In terms of acceleration, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether Ernie spoke about it, but we, if you are to keep the temperatures below two degrees Celsius, um, we have a bit of a s small amount of headroom of how much CO2 we can emit. We have emitted, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about 3,200 gigatons of CO2. And if you are to keep it below two degrees, we can emit roughly 800 gigatons more. We are emitting at a rate of about 40 gigatons per year, approximately, and that rate is increasing. So even if that rate were flat today, we have less than 20 years to go. And so typically, energy technologies require from the lab to full-scale impact on the order of 15 to 20 years. And we are still inventing those technologies in various labs across the world. So if, if there's an acceleration, there's an urgency needed because otherwise we would be in trouble as was uh, discussed yesterday by Ernie. So what are those transformations that are going on? Where are we today? And what else do we need? Is something I'd like to sort of elaborate and I'm sure there'll be discussions uh, later on during the day. So what are the game-changing things that have happened around the world? The first one is, uh, I'd like to talk about is this game-changing thing on, on natural gas. And way back in 1982, the Department of Energy supported um, research on combining um, horizontal drilling and hyd hydraulic fracturing. Both had independently developed, but to do so in shale formations was a radical idea. No one thought it was worth, um, worth the attention, but nevertheless, here we are after 30-something years where we have um, we have essentially changed the ball game uh, for the world in terms of unconventional gas. And we, today, we extract about anywhere from 15% to maximum 20% of the hydrocarbons that is there, and, and still we have um, a cost parity, almost cost parity, in terms of marginal cost. And that technology is improving, and that marginal cost is going to come down because the yields are going to go up. And what we're likely to see is a massive increase in, in trading in natural gas around the world, and this, we believe, is going to help decarbonize just like we are finding the switch from coal to natural gas in the United States purely based on economic reasons and to some extent on, on the policy. So this is a major breakthrough. It took about 30 plus years to develop. And as I said, we, in looking ahead, we don't have that kind of time frame. We need to reduce the time frame. But this is a game changer globally. The other one that we are seeing is the cost of renewables reduction that has gone on around the world. Uh, when uh, we were in the Department of Energy, we started a program called Sunshot, and that was to not to go to the sun and return within a decade safely, but to reduce the cost of solar to five cents a kilowatt hour before the end of the decade and five cents a kilowatt hour without subsidies. What we are finding is that we, we have reached that goal um, in, in, before the decade, before the end of the decade. And these are some, some prices. I don't know if I have the laser out here. These are some prices. I don't think there's a laser, or is there? These are some contract prices that have been struck in various parts of the world where it is going below $20, approaching $20, and likely to go below $20 a megawatt hour. And what is disruptive about this is the fact that it's crossing the, the levelized cost of electricity from nuclear, which is in really giving 
nuclear a bit of a hiccup in terms of its viability. And at the same time, it's going below global coal and gas. And so this is just solar. The same thing is happening in wind. And no one had expected 10 years ago that it would come down at this drastic uh, reduction and this accelerated. And we're finding the global deployment of solar and wind in this early stage of this S-curve. And about 300 to 400 billion dollars of global investments is going into this. The remarkable thing about this, uh, there are two remarkable things. One is that the grid was never designed for fluctuating renewables. It was the Tesla Edison architecture and the paradigm that we live in was designed for slowly moving turbo machinery tracking as a slave tracking the load, the load being the master. And now the generation is going to be the master and the load will have to track or we will need some amazing storage technologies, which I'll talk about. So this is a major transformation for the grid itself, how it operates, how it's designed, how the markets are created, what kind of pricing we have, all kinds of issues. And this will have major implications on new technologies that we need. At the same time, the other remarkable thing is that the first time in history we are looking at carbon-free electricity as the cheapest way to produce electricity in many, many, many parts of the world. Earlier it used to be hydro. Right now, this is at, at less than two cents is unprecedented. It's a historic moment in, in less than two cents a kilowatt hour or $20 a megawatt hour. And the use of this carbon-free electricity, not just for electricity, but for other things, is yet to be, yet to be decided. And we often talk about, for example, in California, we've got 30% penetration. And no one talks about the denominator. It's 30% of today's electrical capacity. If you're trying to electrify transportation, or if you're trying to take the electricity and, and decarbonize our petrochemical industry, for example, that denominator is going to increase even more. And so we are seeing the early days of penetration, not 30%, but I would say 5% of the overall electricity use in the future. The other transformation that is, that's happening is the cost of lithium ion batteries. And again, this has come down by a factor of five over the last decade or so, and I don't think anyone had really expected it to come down this fast. And what we're finding is that the battery packs now for transportation are at about anywhere from $150 to $200 a kilowatt hour. These are global prices. And now if it enters this band out here, $150 or about $100 a kilowatt hour, which is expected in the next five years or so, then the cost of the, the or electric vehicles would, will reach cost and range parity without subsidies uh, compared to gasoline cars. And as we are now seeing this electrification is taking place not just in California and the United States, but more so in China. And India announced that they're not going to sell gasoline cars after 2030. Now, if, if that comes true, that's fantastic. But even if 50% of that happens, that's a big deal. And what is challenging is that the, uh, this requires the charging infrastructure to be created. Otherwise, we have a problem on our hands. And the electricity industry, which is regulated, has never talked to the automobile industry in the past, which is unregulated. And there's a lot of dialogue that needs to happen. And this cannot happen by phone calls. This has to happen in an automated way. And we are in the process of launching a major initiative at Stanford to create an open platform for EV charging infrastructure. So these are some of the major energy game changes that have happened over the last 30 plus years. But there are some other trends which are worth noting. One is that of demographic trends. The world population today, it's about seven and a half billion people, and it is likely to go up to about 10 billion people um, around the world and by 2100. And most of the population growth will happen in Africa, and that depends on the fertility of women in Africa, so there's a big uncertainty as well. If you look at the where the population is going to grow, 
you can see from this chart, this is from the United Nations, that is most likely to be in the urban regions, which means this is purely out of economic reasons, which means the demand for energy because of the urban setting, it's gonna go up. And uh, at the same time, the, it's worth noting the growth rates of these urban regions. This is Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North American Ocean. So if you look at these, these are mega cities, the big red dots. These are the medium scale cities, one to five million people. And what you're finding is that the mega cities are growing at anywhere from three to 4% annually. And the smaller or the medium scale cities are growing even higher than 10% per year. And this is an amazing growth rate. And as you can well imagine, these are not the most planned growth. And so we have to figure out how to provide access to clean energy to these urban regions where the, the growth is happening in an unplanned way. And this is a major issue which I don't think we have really tackled very much. And so uh, you know, in terms of the grid, in terms of transportation, um, I think we have a big challenge on our hands uh, looking ahead. A lot of people talk about you know, solar and wind and batteries, uh, et cetera, LEDs, of course. But one of the things that is, is not appreciated enough is that of cooling technology. And that is because if you look at where the growth is happening, both economic growth and population growth, it is happening in emerging economies. India is growing at, the economy is growing at about 7.5% per year. And, and you have similar growths in other smaller regions all along the tropical regions. And if you have, if people who are growing in the tropical regions have a little bit of money in their pocket, one of the first things they'll buy is an air conditioner. And just to give you an idea of what that scale is, this is number of degrees cooling days uh, ranked by the number of degree cooling days. And you can see Miami is over here on the top regions. This is Chennai, Bangkok, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Ahmedabad, and all of these cities are in areas where the economic growth is happening about seven to eight percent a year. So this is a major tsunami that is coming. And it is, this is a very nice article in The Economist a few years back where this is the energy consumption forecast on heating. And you can see today we use, for between heating and cooling, heating dominates because it's in the temperate regions of the world. And you can see the forecast of the uh, energy consumed for cooling and is going to cross over because of the economic growth and the population in the emerging economies. This is a big challenge because if you look at the refrigerants that we use today, they have a global warming potential of about two to 3,000 times that of CO2. And this is a paper from PNAS a few years back where it showed that the global warming due to the leaked refrigerants in the atmosphere is, will be anywhere from 10 to 40 percent of that of CO2. And so we have a challenge not only, we have a double whammy, because on one hand the demand is going to increase, on the other hand we cannot use the old technology. So we need both technology and scale at the same time. And we really don't have any drop-in solutions for sure. So if you ask the question, how do we decarbonize our economy in a cost-effective way? Well, these are, this is my list, and I'm sure others can add to this list. One is to fuel switch from coal to natural gas. And with global access to cheap natural gas or some kind of low-carbon fuel like methanol. And this shift from coal to gas is starting to happen. It's happened in North America. It has not happened in other parts of the world, but this would be at least a temporary kind of a stopgap arrangement to, to go from coal, which is highly intense uh, in terms of carbon emissions, to about half the carbon emissions per kilowatt hour, which is natural gas, as long as we make sure that the natural gas does not leak. Because if you have leakage in natural gas anywhere higher than 4%, the impact on global warming is, is more than that of burning coal. So that's number one. The second is to obviously integrate solar and wind technologies 
But the integration requires much more than just connecting it to the grid. We got to reduce the cost of storage, and I'm going to talk about that, as well as nuclear energy. Today, nuclear energy cost in terms of just, most of the cost is in construction cost, and that construction cost is anywhere from $8 a watt to a north of that, and there are major delays happening. This is in the United States and France. While solar and wind costs are coming down with scale, the cost of nuclear is actually going up the more we do. It's a negative learning rate. And except in Korea, South Korea, not North Korea, South Korea, where the cost is about three and a half dollars per watt, and the cost is coming down. So there's, they've done something in North Korea that we should be looking at. So nuclear energy is still too expensive. And of course, carbon capture, utilization, sequestration. I'll talk a little bit about that. Decarbonizing transportation, first by electrification, which is happening, but we got to have low carbon fuels as an option, whether it's hydrogen, methane, methanol, or some kind of a zero net carbon fuels, whether it is biofuels and others. Those are too cost, uh, they're not cost effective today, but that's where the research needs to go in to increase the efficiency, whether it's photosynthesis or other things. And, and this is a major research effort that should happen. Finally, this is one of the most difficult things to do, is to decarbonize industrial heat. And, and we need to do this because otherwise, uh, making steel, concrete, petrochemicals, and food consumes a lot of our energy. And this is all based on natural gas heating and, or coal heating. And this needs to be decarbonized. Can we use very cheap electricity to have electrical heating um, decarbonized electricity, renewable electricity for inductive heating, et cetera. This is, is still in play at this point. Not much has been done, and there's a lot more that needs to be done. And finally, low global warming potential cooling solutions, energy efficiency, conservation, et cetera. Let me first talk about storage. And, and people obviously, first, the first thought that comes to mind is can we make batteries? Well, that is true, that we, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but let me give you an example of Stanford campus. You see these tanks out here, these are not flow battery tanks, these are water tanks. And the way Stanford campus runs is that we draw electricity from the grid and we run a big heat pump. On one side is cold, on the other side is hot. And this cold water is stored in those two gray tanks and the hot water side is stored in that red tank. It's not red hot, it's painted red, but just to say that's the red hot, that's a, the hot tank. And we run our cooling and heating system on our campus using water, which is the best heat transfer fluid you can think of, and, and, and then re have recuperative heat exchange on the, uh, on, the, on the various flows. So this is how we do, and when the electricity price is low, we grab the electricity stored in thermal storage, and the electricity price is high, we only run lighting and some motors. That's how we do it. And this is, it's not a cogent plan, so the carbon, as the grid gets decarbonized, which is absolutely necessary for decarbonizing economy, um, this gets cleaner and cleaner. And it's a very cost-effective solution. And this is 10 times cheaper than lithium-ion batteries. And I, I just put it out there because I think we need to broaden our concept of storage when we are looking for storage solutions. But we do need electricity storage in electrochemical or other means. The cheapest way to, produce, to store electricity today is pumped hydro. And, and we, if we have dams and we have elect, hydroelectric dams with the transmission lines already there, we should be thinking about how to make it uh, pumped as well so that we can store the electricity out there. But we can't do this everywhere, so we do need some kind of electrochemical storage, electricity storage. And so one of the organizers of this, Yet Ming, I don't know if he's here, um, there you are, he had a wonderful paper that came out in Juul in terms of the cost of batteries and what is the sort of the lower limit of lithium ion, vanadium redox flow batteries, sodium, lithium, et cetera. And what the major conclusion was is that if you have like three to four hours, of a need for storage. For example, in a duck curve that's going on in California uh, on a daily basis, you know, lithium ion batteries at lower price, like $80 a kilowatt hour, can help in that shifting the load. 
But as you have deeper penetration of renewables, we will need more than three to four hours. We may need eight hours, and we really don't know at this point whether we have the solutions. And certainly for multi-day solution, it needs to be much cheaper, and we really don't have any solutions. And this goes back to the chemistries that we're using. And there's a wonderful piece, and, and I encourage you to read this. If you look at the cost of the chemicals in dollars per kilowatt hour, uh, we are in that circle, lithium and batteries are over there, whereas we should be looking for something over here using you know, widely available materials that are almost dirt cheap. We need dirt to do this. And so this is a challenge that I think many of the labs are looking at, but it's, it's, it's worth absolutely focusing on this particular science and engineering. Let me shift gears a little bit and talk about cooling. This is the Sankey diagram of the United States. I haven't used the word, but this is the Sankey of the United States itself. And on the left-hand side are the supply of energy, the primary energy. On the right-hand side is the demand, and in between are all the flows. And I'm sure you've seen this before. The things in the red square are the things that, are, that have to go through heat. And 90% of our energy today goes through heat. And we don't pay enough attention to this. If you are to decarbonize, whether it is you know, on the supply side, whether it's our engines, whether it is the use of heating and cooling, which is a majority, as we introduce LEDs in our lighting, heating and cooling is gonna be a major dominant source of greenhouse gas emissions. We have to look at this very, very carefully. One of those re uh, aspects is building cooling. And I'm coming back to this because I think it is underappreciated and it is hugely important. On the left-hand side is a graph where you're sh this is showing the peak electricity demand of China and India due to air conditioning. And as you can see, in the next 10, 15 years, it's, uh, China is going to reach a terawatt of electrical capacity needed for the peak. The United States' whole electricity capacity is a terawatt. That's what we're talking about. And India is fast rising because India's population is going to exceed that of China. And the GDP is growing faster right now. So this is, this is the tsunami that we're hitting. And I'm just showing this out here. This kind of coincides, uh, corresponds to what we are seeing uh, happening in China. So how do we need cooling? How do we get cooling? We need heat engines. And heat engine is the generic term for both power generation and for cooling. And this is what heat engines are all about. This is a hot reservoir, cold reservoir, and this is for refrigeration, this is for power generation, and we can have many kinds of work. Normally we look at mechanical work, which we convert that to electricity, but there could be other work as well. If you plot that on a temperature entropy diagram, this is in undergraduate thermodynamics, um, this is what it looks like. You have, this is the power generation, this is the refrigeration cycle, if you go the opposite way, but the, the important thing out here is the entropy. It's all about the entropy. And the question is, where does the entropy come from? Well, today, the entropy comes from the uh, entropy of evaporation of a fluid, from a liquid state to a gas state, which is a large entropy change. And, but there are other forms of entropy that we should not ignore, which have zero global warming potential. Entropy could be electric dipoles in a, in a material, in a solid. The entropy could be magnetic dipoles. These are orientational entropy. It could be configurational entropy of electrons in K-space, which is what thermoelectrics is all about. Uh, or it could be configurational entropy of the gas molecules from a liquid to a vapor. It's a configurational entropy, which is dominant today, but that is giving us problems. Or it could be entropy of the solvent solute in a redox reaction. Since we're focusing on flow batteries, well, why not look at this as well? And, or a chemical entropy of a redox uh, medium. Let me give you one example that we have been working on for the last few years, and that just came out in a paper in 2018, this year, on looking at flow batteries and looking at the entropy of the redox reactions and using it for cooling and heating. So it turns out that if you plot the voltage, open circuit voltage, of, let's say, a ferricyanide reaction and a vanadium redox reaction in a, in a redox pair, if you plot the voltage as a function of temperature, you find that there's, the voltage goes down, and this, this uh, voltage over, over temperature is essentially the entropy. 
and that gives you a value of around 3 millivolts per Kelvin. Now, this is an extremely high value, and there are other redox pairs out here. This is minus 1.4, this is 1.7. If you, if you take the difference, you get 3.1, and which is what we measure. There are other ones out here, and the entropy of redox reaction was known. It just had not been used for refrigeration cycle. What is surprising out here, which surprised us, is the value 3 millivolts per Kelvin. This is about twice the value of the entropy change from liquid to vapor which is very, very surprising. And what we think is happening is that when you have a redox reaction going on, the solute molecules are surrounded by lots of water molecules, and those, the number of water molecules is more than one. And so we think that there's a little bit of amplification that happens, and we get this enormously high number of three millivolts per Kelvin, which is, by the way, 10 times higher than the entropy of electrons in a thermoelectric material. So this is fascinating. We're just starting to do this. I hope others join in and find other better solutions as well. Let me say a little bit about carbon management. And this question on global carbon management was triggered by a question by Ernie Moniz when he was a secretary, and a few of us were on his advisory board. And about six months remaining, I wish he had asked the question a little bit earlier. Is Ernie here, or has he left? Already, he's probably left. Um, he asked the question six months before, a very important question, what are the R&D opportunities that we should be pursuing today that would have a gigaton scale impact in the future on reducing the carbon in the atmosphere? And if you look at the flow of carbon, we find that we are emitting about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, which is about 36 to 37 gigatons of CO2 per year. We absorb around 120 gigatons by photosynthesis, but we also let go of around 118. Okay, so there's a big biological photosynthetic cycle. And the oceans are absorbing about 90 gigatons of carbon and letting go slightly less than that. And so there's this net effect is, is acidifying our oceans, but there's a big cycle which has traditionally been in balance. And what is disrupting the balance is this little 10 gigatons of carbon per year. That's the one that is disrupting. So if you are to manage carbon, A, you have to realize this is at the gigaton scale. It is not a megaton problem. And so what options do we have? So my colleague, Sally Benson, created this, who was part of this task force, created this wonderful kind of flow chart, which seems complicated because it is on, on, on uh, concentrated sources of CO2 versus air. And there's various ways to capture the carbon, whether it's concentrated sources, whether it's through you know, solvents, or sorbents, or cryogenic. Air capture could be through you know, biological, like photosynthesis, or if you want to do chemical. And then it goes into some kind of a carbon compound, whether it's CO2 or CO or some hydrocarbons or inorganic, inorganic like bicarbonates out here, and then it can go to all, this is the final fate of the carbon. If it happens to go into fuel or chemical, we can use, reuse the fuel and it goes back out here, and we close the cycle, but really at this point, we need to be thinking about a permanent sequestration as well. So this, as you can see, as I said, it's very complex. The question is, what pathway do we get from left to right that is both scalable to the gigaton scale and cost effective, because it cannot be too expensive, otherwise it'll never scale. So this is a difficult challenge. And it's important to note that if you are to do this at the gigaton scale, it's not going to be the government or Stanford University or Caltech. It has to be the industry. And so you ask the question, how many industries today are at the gigaton scale and the number is handful. It's oil, gas, coal, concrete, steel, and agriculture. That's it. And so if you are to solve this problem at the gigaton scale, these industries have to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And that's our message to the oil and gas industries, which are, at this point, the most interested 
in addressing this problem is to be part of the solution because you know how to handle gigaton scale. And this is actually resonating with the oil and gas industry, which are now looking at this and looking at how to decarbonize at the same time and not completely give up their business because otherwise they go bankrupt. So this is a shift that's happening. How much they turn and how fast they turn will decide the future of their business. And so this is an extremely difficult time for this oil and gas industry on how to pivot while sustaining the business and having revenue and still be part of the solution of decarbonizing the world. A few examples of that as, as part of this report that we wrote, which came out in Juul as a commentary, is synthetic transformation of CO2. And, and this is how do you take CO2 and turn it into something? whether it's chemicals or fuel. And of course, this needs energy. And fortune, and this energy better be carbon free or carbon neutral. And this better be cheap because the enthalpy of these reactions is such that uh, if you really want to make it cost effective, the cost of exergy, I should say, should be much lower. There's an upper bound for it. And we think the upper bound is about $30 a megawatt hour. And what we're now finding for the first time in history is that wind and solar are coming below that. So this is a very fortuitous moment that at scale we are getting lower than $30 a megawatt hour in wind and solar, carbon free. And now the question is, the boundary conditions are right, do we have the right pathways? And this is where the research is going on. You're gonna hear from Tom Haramio, who's gonna elaborate on the electrochemical and photochemical and some of the thermochemical but just to iterate some of the fundamental reactions in a water splitting reaction, as you know, is a very important one. CO2 reduction, CO2 dissociation into CO. If you can get CO and hydrogen, frankly, we are in pretty good shape. There are some downhill reactions of going from direct methane to methanol, which has been tried out for long. This is one of the most fundamental reaction of CH bond activation. We don't have direct paths. We are seeing some zeolites and all you know, getting to getting to produce methanol, but this is st still a long way to go in terms of scaling. A lot more research needs to go in here, and of course, oxidative coupling methane, big deal. Still, these are research problems. I, I thought I'll show you a little bit of what's going on in, in my lab, just very one slide, on the thermochemical route. And the reason we have picked up thermochemical is because the chemical industry today is, is almost exclusively thermochemical. There's a lot of work going on and that has gone on in this field. Um, and we just thought that we'll approach it in a slightly different way of using a two-step reaction of taking a metal oxide, heating it up to get the oxygen out and get some vacancies, and, and then using that to grab the oxygen and reduce water and CO2 into water, hydrogen and CO. And what we found is that there is a class of oxides which are you know, which somehow had not been explored in the past that is giving us some very interesting results. This is a paper on water splitting um, at much lower temperatures than what, we had, what people had seen before. This is a paper that we're just writing up on CO2 dissociation to CO. What we are finding is that these uh, it, the iron deficiency in a ferrite creates this amazing phase transition that really helps, and we are finding we're producing five to 10 times the capacity of CO2 dissociation compared to the state-of-the-art materials which are cerium oxide, perovskites, et cetera. A lot more work to be done. The questions we're asking, can we reduce the temperatures down to you know, below 900 degrees, which the industry can handle? Still, today we are above 1,000 degrees, slightly above 1,000 degrees. And of course, can we increase the kinetics and all? But this is an example, a lot more, and you'll hear from Tom after this. Let me say a little bit about biology. Because as you saw, we have 120 gigatons of carbon coming in through photosynthesis. And you can see the oscillations of that in the Keeling curve. And we are letting go about 118 gigatons of carbon. And we asked the question, could we tweak that in some way and get a few more percent down in the soil and keep it there so that we can get to the gigaton scale? And one of the ideas that we propose should be researched is that given that we have so much of, of our toolbox in genetic manipulation and editing, 
could we somehow look at this opportunity to look at crops and plants that can be produced with roots having much higher lignin content as well as much deeper. What is known is that the, the degradation of carbon in the soil goes down exponentially with the depth. And if you can put these roots deeper down with higher lignin content, there's a good chance that we could do that. This is certainly we should do that for forestation and reforestation. But the crops are done on an annual basis and thereby we have the opportunity to do it on an annual thing. So this is an opportunity that I think we should be looking at very carefully. And a report to DOE, to Ernie, was that this may not be only a Department of Energy thing. You should be talking to Department of Agriculture and other agencies to be able to fund this kind of research. And finally, um, CO2 capture, which still remains expensive, and that goes, if you translate why there is a cost, it's too high a cost of CO2 capture, and that can be translated to kinetics and thermodynamics. If you look at the heat of re any associative dissociative reaction, has a heat of reaction, the heat of reaction is on the x-axis and the rate constant is on the y-axis, and today's uh, monoethanol amines or you know, um, hydroxyl, uh, sodium hydroxide or, or calcium hydroxide is they lie along this line. These have very high enthalpies, which means it has, you need, and there's an energy cost to dissociate, and that's the operating cost. And they have high rate constants, but these do not have high enough rate constants, so you need to big, build a big enough plant. They're not, not selective enough, so you need to build a bigger, so that increases the capital cost. So here's kinetics um, related to capital cost, and here's uh, the heat of reaction related to operating cost. The sweet spot is over here, and we don't have any compounds today in that way. So this is where the science really needs to go, and we are seeing a few examples of that using MOFs, et cetera, but there are some challenges in scaling those te techniques, but this is where the, the, the sweet spot is. Let me end my talk by saying a little bit about you know, innovation and acceleration, and I'll give a historical example. If you go back in history and look at mobility, till about um, 1700s or so, and before that, we were using um, horses for, for commuting. And, and this has been going on for roughly 10,000 years. And if you look at that technology, as we went over the years, the technology improved. We got either better horses or lighter wheels, or better bearings for the wheels, and they became better and better. And the cost came down, the performance went up, and as you increased in scale, you know, this, this, it followed incremental improve in existing technology, which is absolutely important. But I think we are at a stage where this is necessary, but clearly not sufficient. We need some new technologies to really help all the things that I just talked about. For that, you need to, give a, you need to take shots at goal. And this is the transformation that happened in mobility, where early on in the 1600s, 1800s, they said, why don't we take this framework of the wheels and instead of horse, put an engine? And finally, you know, they tried, they failed, it was too expensive, but the idea was seeded in those days. And eventually, one of those technologies was the Model T, which scaled up in manufacturing and not only became cheaper, it became disruptive because it was cheaper, cleaner, faster. And that's an example, historical example, where you could go from this technology, which is incremental improvement, and this, it, this technology made that obsolete. And if you ask the question, do we have some, some examples? Yes, we do. All the things about natural gas and you know, shale or wind and solar or batteries that I showed followed this kind of a disruption Lithium-ion batteries making nickel metal hydride batteries obsolete. So this is, we need this whole ecosystem. We are at the university stage, we are generally at the proof of concept of a proof of a system. But beyond that, it needs the pilot, it needs some supply chain development, it needs manufacturing to all the way to a plant, and at the end of the day, it needs business and deployment and business. And as you go down the scale, you need access to capital because it's not enough to just show it. You need, you know, in the energy business, scale 
and cost is everything. And to get to the scale, this is not software. And so you need capital. And so if you ask the question, what do we do? Well, this is where RPE is. RPE is looking at transformational ideas that have the potential to become a Model T. But this is too early at this point, and people think of RPE as here's a commercial entity. It's not. It's all about research to find new ideas. But you need science all the way. People think that this is research and this is manufacturing. Research is needed all the way from here to there. And today, even today, Intel is still doing research. But research at the scale of out here. And so if you look at this whole ecosystem, while many of us are over here, one needs to think of this holistically. So while we certainly need the R&D, we need a policy that really aligns the markets, the regulatory approach, the taxes and finance to align the R&D, which is where most of us are, to afford technology innovation. But we also need the policies to create the markets so that businesses can flourish. And fr frankly, we don't have that. And and the access to low-cost, long-term capital. This is not your typical venture capital that you want to get 5x in five years and you get out of there. That doesn't work, as we have now seen in most of the cases. And we are now seeing other approach to risk capital, which has a long-term view, as well as other capital sources for a later stage where the risk is lowered and the returns are lower as well. But this kind of an ecosystem that goes all the way from here to there as a thriving ecosystem is very, very important to provide that acceleration to some innovative technologies. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions.